Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Solid State Physics in a Nutshell, brought to you by the Colorado School of Mines. I'm Eric. And I'm Nicole. So far, Eric, we've been assuming we only have one electron in our entire system. Right. And it's just in a box. Yep. Isn't that a bit simple? So how can this model work so well for solids? In short, it comes down to screening and some assumptions about the type of interactions allowed within a solid. And isn't screening how an electron won't seed the nucleus because all the core electrons are in the way? Yeah, an example of that would be the helium atom with two protons and two electrons. So now I bring in a third electron, the potential it feels is basically zero until it can get past these two electrons. Okay, but what about solids? So solids are a bit trickier. With the square well, we're assuming screening is so effective there's no spatial variation in the potential within the solid. On the other extreme, we could assume the screening is weak, and then we'd have a 1 over r columbic potential for the nuclei. In practice, real metals have potentials like this, where screening is highly effective unless the electron is very close to the nuclei. The question then is, how close can an electron get to a nucleus in a metal before screening breaks down? Let's start by invoking that the local internal chemical potential is a function of the local electron concentration, n. Additionally, we know that at equilibrium, the chemical potential is constant throughout this free electron gas. Finally, we know that when there's no electrostatic contribution to the chemical potential, the chemical potential can be approximated as the Fermi level, which we can connect to the electron density, n. So we're going to start by bringing in a nucleus, which will create a local change in the electrostatic potential. The filled energy levels are shown with these lines, and the perturbation is this bump here. The strength of the perturbation is given by minus E delta V. At the perturbation, there's increased local charge density N. Thus, the positive charge screens itself from far away electrons by piling up charge nearby. The local change in potential needs to be self-consistent with this change in electron density. Away from the perturbation, the density of states is what you might expect with filled states to the Fermi level. How do you think this will change once we add the extra charge? Well, more charge means more energy, so would the graph just shift by the charge times del V? Indeed it does, and we can figure out the resulting change in the electron density using the rectangle approach we used last time, where the height is the density of states at the Fermi level, and the width is the distortion E del V. Now we have the tools to figure out this del V. We'll need to start with Maxwell's equation for the divergence of E. And I know E is just the grad of the potential V, so now we have minus del squared V equals rho over epsilon naught. But really we want to look at the distortion del V. So we want the change in charge density, E del N of R. And luckily we just solve for del N of R. So we can plug that back in, and we end up with a relatively simple DE. Rather than solving it out, here's the solution to how the potential changes with this perturbation. The potential varies with R, and we introduce this term R sub TF, where the TF comes from Thomas Fermi. RTF is related to how close an electron has to get to the nucleus before it feels a non-zero potential gradient. Oh, so it's the width of our potential well? Not quantitatively, but that's a pretty decent way to remember it anyway. Let's consider some limits. As RTF goes to infinity, our expression for the potential perturbation goes to the unscreened 1 over r value. And at the other limit, the potential is almost like a delta function well. So the electron has to get incredibly close before feeling the attractive pull of the nucleus. So let's bring the screening length back to the density of states and the carrier concentration. Well, we know that RTF is inversely proportional to the square root of the density of states. And we also have this expression for the density of states. So we see that increasing carrier concentration n leads to a shorter screening length. Going back to metallic solids then, the reason why the free electron model works so well is because the electron rarely gets close enough to feel the atomic nuclei. But what if you go through a phase transition and you no longer have a large carrier concentration? Then your screening length is going to go up enormously 
and the few free electrons that remain are going to see the atomic cores much more strongly, and we'd call that a Mott transition. Okay, so as a recap, the free electron model works well for solids because screening is so high that the conduction electrons don't feel the potential from the other atoms. So when we invoked a flat bottom box, that arose from shielding the nucleus from the free electrons. Who knew it would really be that simple? Next time we're going to develop some new expressions for dispersion in periodic solids that actually starts to take this potential into account. Thanks for watching Solid State Physics in a nutshell. See you then.